And thank you everybody for being here and thank you for your listening. I know that it might be a big challenge to listen to a non-native English speaker, especially at this time of the afternoon after a long day. So I thank you, I really thank you in advance for your trust, for your listening and for being here. And I look forward to talk with you about your work maybe later or tomorrow. And let me thank you, Professor Grassa, for this invitation which honored me. And also I sincerely thank the Research Center uh, on Child Study at the University of Mino for hosting this special event and this conference. So when I was invited to deliver this keynote on the issues was, the theme was childhood education as an ethical, cultural and political challenge. To be honest, I felt a huge sense of responsibility around addressing a topic, because such topic, because we live, as the other keynote has explained this morning very clearly, we live in a time of increasingly super diversity, new waves of racial discriminations, ethical fragmentation, and high levels of social conflict. So I don't need to go in depth on this because we are all aware that too many, are, too many families, I would say, with young children uh, are dramatically affected by the inequalities and cultural segregation that still exist, unfortunately, in European society today. So for this reason, I really welcome the conference interest in SCSC centers as key sites, as I will illustrate in my keynote, where intercultural processes of meaning making can foster, I hope, ethical and democratic values that challenge the dominant culture and the dominant discourse today. So democracy, well-being, and dialogue will be the key words of my presentation this evening. The main message is, content, is contained in the title of my keynote, Building Resilience Communities from the Early Years, ACSC Centers, as Place for Connections, Well-Being, and Dialogue. I will use, I will try to explore the potential for a CSC Center to promote social well-being and active participation for both parents and children. I will try to explore their role as intercultural niche. I use the term niche, I draw the term niche um, on arcness and super concept of developmental niche. And I propose this as a framework for understanding how culture guides and impact the way we design the educational environment for young children. The developmental niche, as, my, as you might know, has three components. The physical and social settings in which a child lives, the customs of childcare and child rearing, and the psychology of the caretakers. In early education, I believe these three components are interrelated with educators' implicit ethno-theories, and I underline implicit. I therefore use the term intercultural to express the need, which I believe, I strongly believe, for a more culturally sensitive zero to six curriculum in our European educational communities. And I believe that such curriculum can help to lessen inequalities, encourage community engagement, and reduce the risk of school failure for the most vulnerable, vulnerable children. So within this framework, I interpret children's active plays active participation alongside parents and teacher dialogue as key protective factors and crucial contributors to the development of resilience communities. Let me briefly explain why I think this. We know from research, we know very well, that children have an incredibly powerful predisposition to learn and to actively explore the world. This holds true even when they are disadvantaged lacking in stimuli, or at risk of educational failure. They can still gain strength 
and health, they can become resilient if, and I underline if, they are actively engaged as agents of their own learning in culturally organized activities. We also know from research that, early, that resilience in early childhood plays out as a dynamic ecological process that involves both children and adults. Resilience is an individual ability, but strongly dependent on the broader context, educators, parents, other children, mentors, by acting as tutors of resilience, they play, as you do, as we all do, they play a crucial role in this dynamic interaction and contribute to the development of social support networks that impact children's learnings and well-being. The recent OECD reports in 2018 on the well-being of migrant children clarify that engaging parents in children's learning experiences, developing social cohesion, and a sense of community belonging all act as protective factors for children who experience vulnerability. But although the link between supportive network and school success is now taken as given, we are all aware of this, it is less clear how we should go about promoting these needs in practice. How do we do it in practice? This is an especially important question today because we live in society, as this morning has been already said, where inequalities are always a challenge. And when we go out at designing educational settings, we need to be aware that cohesion and intercultural agreement on educational values are not taken for granted assumptions. In my work as a qualitative researcher over the past year, I have observed many times how challenging it can be when there is a lack of dialogue among those who care for young children. And I have seen how challenging can be, especially when parental participation is not possible, not encouraged, not sustained. This can be particularly true of immigrant children who experience additional barriers to participation and are often marginalized. When this happens, very young children are caught in the middle between home and school, and immigrant parents especially feel inadequate and excluded. And while dialogue remains superficial or formal, none of the parties is ready to compromise. But when parents and practitioners from different cultural backgrounds and from different linguistic backgrounds, experience positive intercultural dialogue concerning the how and why of early education, as I have learned through my research as a scholar and as a parent of three children. <coughs> positive outcomes become much more likely. And this will be both a premise and the main conclusion of my speech to, to this evening. So to illustrate these issues, I will offer some theoretical consideration combined with what I've learned in my research about promoting learning through dialogical experience of making meaning and social participation. I will not dwell this evening on learning outcomes. I will not talk about curricula, although I am aware that these are equally important issues for our discussion to, today. So I will organize my talk as follows. I start by aligning myself to John Dewey's theory of education as democracy, arguing for the need to provide children with democratic experience and communities since the early years. I will then discuss well-being as a primary goal of early education, arguing for the need to better explore how well-being is connected with children's agency, participation, and active engagement in learning. And I conclude with insights from anthropological research, arguing for the need to equip early childhood practitioners with new competencies and skills in intercultural dialogue and cultural education. I'm aware of how challenging, as I said at the beginning of my speech, it can be to listen to a non-native English speaker. 
at this time of the day. So I will combine theories, research evidence with narrative and visual examples from my own work. So my first argument concerns a key responsibility, I believe a main responsibility, that has been widely addressed in the contemporary debate, the need to educate children and all of us to democracy through active participation and social cohesion. This is not a new idea. Think, for example, of the work of many brilliant scholars from the late 20th century today, such as, for example, Peter Moss, Gunilla Dahlberg, Michel van der Broek, Giulia Formosigno, Loris Malaguzzi, Susanna Mantovani in my country, and many, many others. All these scholars have contributed enormously to our current interpretation of early childhood education as places for democracy. However, the many challenges that we face in our community suggest that we urgently need to extend this discussion. And in addressing this question, I would like to go back to the original work of a great philosopher that you all know, John Dewey. Because I believe that his original ideas offer us key insights on how we may work to provide all children with protective, as I said, context, with the power to prevent, hopefully, disconnection, marginalization, and exclusion in their present and future life. As we know, over 100 years ago, ah, something is strange. I forgot the slide. Sometimes I do that, so <laughs> apologize. <laughs> if I do it, remind me that I have slides, though. So, over 100 years ago, in his famous work, Democracy and Education, 1916, the great philosopher John Dewey, who has had enormous impact on how we today understand education, he made the case for viewing education and democracy as bound up to social justice. As he wrote, Democracy was the outcome of ethical and cultural choice rather, rather than a political issue. Individuals, he wrote, do not become a society by living in physical proximity. Individuals do not even compose a social group because they all live, they all work for a common end. The parts of a machine work with a maximum of cooperativeness for a common result, but they do not form a community. If, however, they were all aware of the common end and all interested in it, so that they regulated their specific activity in view of it, then they would form a community. But this would involve communication. Each would have to know what the other was about and would have to have some way of keeping the other informed as to his own purpose and progress. So consensus demands communications. So forming a community requires many components. Having a common interest, working for it as a group, and regulating one activities in view of it. But more importantly today, it requires communication. And communication, we all know, implies engagement, participation, and an optimistic attitude to listening, which is not a taken for granted competence. So let me give you an example of what this could mean today in terms of how we ourselves listen to the children in our communities. A few weeks ago, I read a fascinating story in an Italian newspaper that has many points of contact with our discussion today on the development of resilience community. The story is about a 10 years old child, Maria. Maria lives in Naples, in a neighborhood that is affected by violence and mafia activity, and she loves reading books. Her family is economically disadvantaged. She used to feel isolated from her peers, spending most of the time alone. One day, her school teacher gave the class an assignment, writing a letter to someone they consider highly important. Maria decided to write the letter to the mayor of the city. Dear mayor, she wrote, I would like to have a library in my city. By library, I mean a place where I can meet other children, experience the pleasure 
of connecting with others, meet new friends, read, cultivate my interest. A library, she said, is a place for people who connect, to connect with one another and discuss the issues that are important to them. I would like to have a library. This has always been, been my dream. When the mayor received the letter, he was impressed by Maria's word. He took his time, he reflected, and after a few weeks, he decided to meet the child. The outcome of the meeting was that the mayor promised to do his best to help her to realize her dream. So he did not know what to expect, but he knew definitely that the idea of a child deserved attention. So surprisingly, from that moment onwards, cooperativeness began to manifest itself, leading to a joint effort by many people to achieve a goal that they were all interested in. Volunteers, members of the community, teachers, families, and grandparents did their part to realize Maria's dream. A fundraising process was initiated by a group of families and people from other parts of the city and through Italy bought books and bookshelves, and everybody made some contribution. So thanks to this collaborative effort, one of the most difficult neighborhoods in Naples began to change. The library has become a positive and pleasant place for people who do not know one another to meet and share books and to communicate, again, as Dewey was arguing many, many years ago. The dream of a child is transforming a neighborhood and its inhabitants. So Maria's dream, I would argue tonight, is a modern metaphor of Dewey's theory. Education is a democratic process when it flows from public engagement and debate. And this can happen more naturally, let's say, when the common goal is the belief is the well-being of young children. Children are catalysts for us to meet and to engage in interaction and communication. But this, again, requires dialogues, responsibility, shared responsibility, and a lot of communication. In Dewey's words, the very process of living together educates, it enlarges and enlightens experience, it stimulates and enriches imagination, it creates responsibility for accuracy and vividness of statement and thought. So democracy is a form of life and schools and early childhood settings as miniature societies have a key role to play in generating democratic experience. And this happened because they are not decontextualized. They are very connected to our societies. But viewing democracy as education, as you all know, it is not easy and it is not an unproblematic undertaking. Dewey's contemporary, Paul Frere, Observe in his Pedagogy of Freedom in 1921 that consensus is reached via conflictual situation. There may not be life, he wrote, or human existence without struggle, without conflict. Denying conflict, we ignore even the most mundane aspect of our vital and social experience. So trying to escape conflict, we preserve the status quo. So conflict, are not only a problem, they can also become resource. And this is very true, especially with young children. Loris Malaguzzi, one of the most, the great educationalists of the last century in Italy, proposed that educational communities are places where conflict and disagreement can become resources for making meaning and socially constructing knowledge. But this, again, can only take place via the active engagement participation as opposed to involvement of all the actors in educational life, children, parents, educators, ordinary citizens, policy makers. ECSC could be a place where multiple actors spontaneously talk about education. And here I go back again. Education as democracy requires a lot of communication, dialogue and sharing sharing important ideas, sharing perspectives and resources, and sharing expectations, and then developing relationship. So democracy requires many, many things, but if we 
succeed in involving parents and teachers, no matter where they come from, what language they speak, what are their cultural value, then we could, pre we could try to give them the key protective factors to develop well-being. So let me move now to my second argument. Well-being as the capacity of a child and the possibility of a child to be part of learning experience. Well-being, we know, is a polysemantic concept and a key word in the current debate. We are all aware that children's well-being is usually defined as the realization of children's rights and the fulfillment of the opportunity of every child to be all he or she can be. So we know this very well, but, and I will not go in depth on this. I would like to single out two macro interpretations of well-being among the many currently proposed in the literature. The first interpretation identifies well-being with happiness, positive emotions, care, so it emphasizes the socio-emotional development dimension of wellness. The second relates well-being to the acquisition of skills and competencies, learning processes, resilience, and empowerment. I build my argument around this second idea following Brunner's notion of learning as a socially shared process in which children, again, are active participants as opposed to recipients of information. In support of this proposition, I go back to Celestine Frenet, I don't know who know, I guess many, definition of children's well-being as the full life. He offered this definition in a time of highly suffering and very conflictual situation after the Second World War. But I think that this idea, it is still valid and a very inspiring provocation for us today. A child who enjoys well-being, he wrote, is a child who feels good with him or herself and with others who works, plays intensively with commitment. Children have no innate need to play. There is only the need to work, to act, to handle, to move, to do and undo, including with others. There is an organic need to explore the potential for activity that is concurrently individual and social, is purposeful and offers a wide radius of action. In addition, this work must support one of the most pressing mental imperativeness, especially at that age, the sense of power, the permanent wish to excel, to win victories, small or large. So two aspects, to me, emerge from Frenet's discussion of wellness, and I view both as crucial to well-being as we understand it today. The first is children engagement and commitment to learning as the capacity to be proactive in exploring new things and to tend towards new, uh, towards ambitious goals despite difficulty. And the second is children's active participation as the capacity to take an active part in the learning process by making decisions and choices. Both participation and agency are key words in the debate on early childhood today, and we are all very aware of this. Uh, there is a broad agreement in the literature that children's capacity to engage in active exploration and their capacity to work hard at being proactive social agents are prerequisite for an outcome of well-being. And this happens because children have this innate sense of discovering, observing the world, and this is their main strength. As we do, and we adults have the responsibility to respect this as a basic right. As Maria Montessori wrote in the late 40s, experience with our children aged from three to six and even younger has shown that not only there is no fatigue in learning at that age, but children actually become stronger. By being intellectually active, they acquire strength and health. So learning is a source of strength. And this happened during the timeless time of the early years, a life stage 
that we adults know we will never experience again, never. When children can enjoy the luxury, I would say, of being tireless learners that generate their own well-being through their incessant activity, a time when children experience an irresistible desire to explore, observe, investigate, share, discover, expand their knowledge, a time which becomes of the greater quality when children receive care, attention, affection, but as well as stimuli, provocation, and scaffolding. High quality learning requires a good balance between care, good relationship, and stimuli and provocation. And here I would like to draw on Bauman's argument that well-being for us as adults, as, and for children of course, includes learning to pursue ambitious goals, no matter what the obstacles we meet along the way. This is great sociologist and philosopher, and one of the greatest thinkers of our time, I guess, in his The Art of Life, suggests that our well-being will be enhanced the most we will have impossible goals. This means learning to tolerate uncertainty, learning to be able to choose a scope and standards well beyond that we were able to do or we would be able to do. Bauma does not relate well-being to peace and calm and quiet. If I set difficult goals for myself, he seems to say, if I perceive, if I engage with uncertainty and fragmentation, I will experience as an adult a drive to succeed that propels me beyond what I'm currently able to do or think I'm able to do. And this will make me experience happiness and a sense of well-being, which seem to coincide with the pleasure of discovering a love of knowledge and learning, commitment and awareness of success. So learning to learn implies well-being insofar as it enables the development of new capabilities, as Amartya Sen has argued. But frequently, however, overprotection, overemphasis on safety, or excessive intervention based on the belief that children are not yet ready prevent this vital energy from realizing its full potential. Think of children's level of independence and autonomy in our urban spaces. And here I speak from the viewpoint of an Italian mother and researcher who live in a big urban city. And think of the reception procedures of newly arriving, arrived children of migrant families who are frequently placed in classes of younger pupils in our school. This can mean undermining, undermining the right to well-being of less advantaged children who may not previously have enjoyed opportunities for exploration at home. If early childhood education and preschool services are public, if they are democratic community, as I said before, using John Dewey's words, then we have the responsibility to offering the best opportunity to learn that we can. But what are the conditions to do what? To do this? We know from research that children enjoy challenges and learning to overcome obstacles as long as a set of key conditions are met, namely a facilitating environment, an educational relationship that, if, that is respectful of each child as unique and diverse, an educator who appreciates children's vitality, potential, inner strength, and is able to initiate them into a process of learning by trial and error, and contexts that offer both stimuli, as I said before, and obstacles. To clarify this point, I would like to offer you a pleasant example of an outdoor experience of learning science through nature. 
filmed at the Nido Bambini Bicocca, the University Internal Infant Toddler Center at my university. I consider this an example of the Italian interpretation of the pedagogy of well-being and as learning in caring contexts through the supportive interaction of others, both adults and children. I thank my Italian colleague, Piera Braga, Susanna Mantovani, and Stella Gabambini, along with their team of educators that you know, but I like to mention them. You don't know, but I like to mention them. Sabrina Croci and Elisa Morteni, who made this video. And the educators made the video and edited the video. And this is a very important goal. And of course, I thank them for the incredible work with young children in my city and for giving me permission to show this to you this evening. So in the video, the facilitating environment, as you might have seen, is provided by nature itself, a few artifacts, and the presence of an attentive and supportive educator. So while, while children can do science based on their spontaneous exploration of flowers and animals, the educator plays an essential part of providing indirect support to their exploration and learning processes. She's present, observes, closely follows the children's exploratory activities. She only intervenes when she judges that it is absolutely necessary. The rest of the time she's watching, using facial expressions to support the children as they conduct their independent exploration. She's play, playing constantly attention, but apparently she says and does very little. She never speaks while the children are speaking, not manipulate the contents of their conversation, but offers idea and thought-provoking remarks to prolong the conversation and prompt further learning about nature and flowers. She does not cut off conversation and dialogue. She neither asks too many questions, nor supplies too many answers. She remains silent when appropriate, accepts uncertainty, and has the patience to wait for the child's next move. And I can tell, she's having fun and pleasure. She's smiling and enjoying discovering nature with the children, and she's actively participating to, as a learner herself. In short, she's a teacher who puts into practice the principles that we have been discussing up to now. She's present in the way that is sensitive, prudent, participatory, without reducing children's freedom to learn and respectful the children's interest and potential. And the result is a shared experience of learning that entails collaboration and intellectual and emotional exchange. And this is true not just for children, but also for us as adults, whose role is to act as model for, of well-being for children by adopting a reflective posture of inquiry and intellectual humility. The message that emerged from the video brings us back to some of the assumptions that I have outlined earlier. Children enjoy challenges and learning to overcome obstacles as long as these are shared with others in nurturing environment. In the video, the teacher observes this enterprise and does not remove obstacles, that fos thus fostering well-being through learning. But what is um, in, I'm worried for the time. I'm too long. Uh, more, ten, minutes. ten minutes. So in doing so, I will cut something. In doing so, also our own well-being as adults and educators, I believe, I strongly believe, will be enhanced because we will develop our critical thinking abilities and the spirit of inquiry and curiosity. And so together, 
we may form places of education to resilience, resilience context for all, both children and adults. Speaking of adults and children who experience the pleasure of doing research together, I define the predisposition to inquiry, using Dewey's words again, as a totalizing emotional experience that generates relationship, connects, and enhance the well-being of both children and adults. And this means educating children to cope with adversity, being curious, turning a misunderstanding into an opportunity to scrutinize or revisit our usual practices, viewing the variety of ways to educate as an opportunity to broaden our horizon. All this means participation, participating in the construction of democratic, communicative, and resilient context. But today, we must be aware that acts and form of learning are culturally determined. So the flowers video we just saw is an example of a culturally informed nature exploration activity in an urban context like Milano, conducted with Italian educators and children. There are many other ways to promote children learning and well-being, just as there are many possible interpretation of our role as support figures in contemporary multicultural educational settings. And this introduced to my last point. Variability in learning occurs as a function of the cultural artifacts, values, practices that we provide to children, both in the home and in the out-of-home educational context. Anthropologic, anthropologists Anthropological research, I'm trying to speed up. Anthropological researcher has clearly explained to us that there are many different ways to bring and to care and to educate children. In some community, for example, well being is met by encouraging children to interact with their companions without the presence of or the supervision of adults. While in other contents, children grow up through their interaction with peers, receiving no guidance from adults. But in other communities, again, on the other hand, where children live are segregated and adults provide them with standardized instruction, learning is more piloted. So taking over or not taking over children learning activities varies from culture to culture. For some community, it is a desirable and necessary educational task, but for others, it is not. It is an act that indicates a serious lack of respect of the child and individual. So there are thousand ways to bring up, care for, educate children, and these ways depend on the different cultural niche that we, to which we belong. And in our life, we have encountered all, I've, I'm sure all of us have encountered this diversity, although we are aware that there are also universal shared principles and goals. So human development is a situated cultural process, and this implies that the goals considered appropriate and desirable at certain age vary considerable, considerably as a function of the cultural context and its tradition. So cultural variation, variation uh, in the lesson to be learned and how to learn them can be to some extent disconcerting and overwhelming. We can feel disoriented when we <coughs> welcome people from other countries or we can hide behind stereotyped position or and this is what I consider most important, we could open up and engage in dialogue with people who hold different cultural and linguistic values. And this, uh, choosing this third pathway means accepting the challenge to engage in cultural practices of exchange and sharing meaning, just as our children. And this in turn means remembering that we occupy three positions in our life. As members of a cultural group, we are, let's say, recipients of models that are handed down to us and that we learn to make our own of in the course of the life experience. We are also observers 
of our own models and those of others, and we are interpreted and participants again, and therefore agents of change. And this triple role represents its strength from an educational point of view. Cultural practices are not static, but subject to change. Just we as adult individuals can do and can change. But to do this, we need to develop the capacity to suspend our judgment of others and engage in respectful dialogue. Effective intercultural dialogue reduces the risk of extreme relativism and encourages changes in practices. You might well ask at this point of my speech, what is dialogue and how can it become a key protective factor in our communities? Is dialogue as community engagement and cultural exchange possible today? Are we ready to promote this by engaging parents in dialogue, especially immigrant parents who might lack of confidence in their language or who hold different cultural values? My reply is that intercultural dialogue implies cultural negotiation. The capacity to build symmetrical and reciprocal interaction and to learn from each other, despite cultural and linguistic diversity. I use the term cultural negotiation to approach the issue of dialogue between parents and teachers. I draw here on the work of Joe Tobin, who explains that cultural negotiation carries a sense of politics and powers that is not explicit present in the terms participation dialogue and communication. If practitioners and parents engage in negotiation, both have to, prepared, to be prepared to put their beliefs and preferences on the table and to compromises. So putting beliefs and preferences on the table require a lot of competencies. It requires awareness, strength, willingness to participate. We cannot ignore today that many parents with young children are not even in a position to participate due to the dramatic condition they live in. Some mothers of fathers or fathers take part in the broader discussion simply by observing silently, listening to the others because they cannot take active part. For many reasons, a lack of confidence in their language competence, different cultural assumptions, different interpretation of the role of parents in school, and etc. The upshot is that too, far too many families today remain locked in an inferior or invisible position at school. Others, in contrast, have voice, and sometimes their voice prevails. But both have the right to be listened to, included, respected, and we are responsible for ensuring that happens both in our communities and hopefully in society. So conflicting viewpoint and different languages, as I mentioned earlier, can actually become a resource if we do like that. And by reinforcing this intercultural dialogic exchange, we will encourage community engagement and democratic participation. So to conclude, I pro propose two out of the many possible recommendations for our work, developing a pedagogy of dialogue within and among our communities to fully promote the participation of children and parents, all children and parents, no matter where they come from. I understand dialogue here as a cooperative actively involving respect, active listening, tolerance of diversity, curiosity, and critical engagement with others. It implies the capacity to overcome monolinguistic and monological and mono, a monological story framework and to discover new understanding through expression and listening to multiple voice and multiple point of view. And of course, the capacity to negotiate meaning at many levels. And number two, I think we need to invest in our capacity to become researcher in our everyday life in early childhood educational communities and to become educators as ethnographers, as a colleague, 
in Italy has argued. This has implications for us as university, offering in-service training for early childhood educational staff and for the government, ministries that provide the resources for improving the quality of our educational settings. The goal is in to encourage anti-bias work through reflexivity, reciprocal learning, observation, cultural decentering, co-learning, and research-based initiatives. So now, at the end of my speech, and I promise it is the very end, as I said many times, I would like to use what Sherry Tarkle in her recent book, Reclaiming Conversation, she proposed as a possible solution to the lack of empathy and increasing conflictuality that characterize our community today. She uses the term caring for words. As she explained, today many children lack of confidence in their ability to communicate with others, deal with, with misunderstanding, listen carefully, negotiate meaning, tolerate divergent viewpoints. Children lack experience, she says, of the kind of authentic, intimate conversation in which we pay full attention to each other and move from conversation to connection. And this is also due to the growth of social networks, as we all know, and technology-mediated communication, which is, to some extent, reducing the opportunities for intimate vis-a-vis -vis conversation. This, she says, is reducing the possibility for children to develop empathy, and therefore social cohesion. My hope for you, for us as the educational community, is that we may increasingly care for meaningful dialogue and conversation as valuable learning experiences in our everyday work, within and without our communities. I believe that developing empathy and social cohesion through meaningful intercultural dialogue will strengthen the role of ACSC as resilient communities for all families with young children, non excluded. So I thank you most sincerely for your attentive and supportive listening tonight, and I apologize for me being somehow maybe not so clear in some point. Thank you.